Okay, all good. You can uh, begin. Thank you. Once again, welcome to the New York City Council Remote Hearing on Parks and Recreation. At this time, will all panelists please turn on your videos? Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. I repeat, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Ku, we are ready to begin. Thank you for joining our virtual hearing today before the Council's Committee on Parks and Recreation. I would like to acknowledge my council, uh, my fellow council members, uh, Damon Diaz, Joan Lai, Moya, Wiley, Borelli, Ayala, and Diana, Yes. Okay. So if more people, more members come, we will we'll announce them later. Good afternoon. I am Peter Ku, Chair of the City Council Committee on Parks and Recreation. I would like to welcome you to our virtual hearing that will examine the state of community gardens and urban agriculture and consider a related piece of legislation. Community gardens play a crucial role in the life of our city. They help provide needed green space in areas that were once lacking, foster a greater sense of community among local residents, provide educational opportunities for our children, contribute to decreasing the effects of climate change, and produce and farm numerous kinds of food products through urban agricultural practices. I have been a supporter of gardens for a long time, and I'm proud that I have one of the largest gardens, if not the largest, garden in the city. Evergreen Community Garden in Kisena Park, which is about five acres large and beloved by my community. Urban agriculture is typically defined as the process of growing food in cities. In addition to other activities, such as food processing and distribution, food waste and collection, the benefits of urban farming are numerous as in addition to providing food for the community. They are also centers of learning where children can learn about nature and how food is produced while being safe spaces that deliver environmental benefits such as reduce city heat, decrease storm water runoff, and safer soil. The city's zoning rules permit agricultural activities in almost all of the city zones, which presents us with the promising hope that there are no outright rules that should impede the growth of this activity. The council in this growing food equity plan, along with so many parks and open space advocates have recognized the need for urban agriculture support and call for various policy pro proposals to support their growth, including having a centralized office or entity that focuses on facilitating the growth and maintenance of urban agriculture. Increasing support for educational programming for farming, for farming at gardens, determining what vacant lots, plots of land are suitable for agriculture and gardening, supporting economic empowerment for gardeners and farmers, and improving the availability and accessibility of data 
regarding urban farms and their use. I'm also curious to examine with more detail what the administration's plans are to increase support for urban farming in community gardens and how they can make it less burdensome on gardeners to make the best use of gardens and farms they operate. My view is that the city should make it more welcoming and less restrictive for those who seek to open a garden or farm in a safe and a reasonable way. Finally, as I mentioned before, we will consider intro number 1059, sponsored by my colleague, Council Member Diana Ayala. This bill would require the Parks Department to conduct a study on the prevalence of community gardens engaged in urban farming and agriculture and to provide recommendation to the mayor and the council on how to better support and increase such farming and agriculture. I look forward to exploring it in greater detail today and hearing what the administration and advocates think about the legislation. Thank you and welcome all of you. At this time, I would like to invite council member Ayala to offer a statement on the bill she has sponsored. Thank you, Chair Ku. Um, and before I give my remarks, I also wanted to recognize former council member Espinal, who was the original uh, sponsor of the bill and thank him for his efforts in helping us craft it. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here today. I am council member Diana Ayala, and I am looking forward to having my bill in Troll 1059 heard today. This bill would require the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation to conduct a study on the prevalence of urban farming and agriculture and to submit a report on its findings. Such reports shall include, but should not be limited to, uh, an understanding of the number of community gardens under the jurisdiction of the Parks Department presently engaged in farming and or food processing, uh, the amount of ty and types of food produced at such gardens, information on the types of equipment used by such gardens for agricultural purposes, including but not limited to greenhouses, hydroponic systems, food processing systems, and composting systems, a list of resources provided by the Department of Parks and Recreation and other government agencies to aid in farming and food processing, information on the availability of potential sites throughout the city that could be developed for urban agricultural purposes, information on the feasibility of costs associated with expanding and the number of farmers uh, markets operating in the uh, Department of Parks and Recreation prop on property, and the number of community gardens that engage in urban agriculture. And it also asks for recommendations on how the city can provide more, uh, provide more technical assistance and financial resources to expand the number of community gardens that engage in uh, urban agriculture. This bill is obviously really important to me and I'm sure to my colleagues, um, as many of us have many community gardens that are engaged in urban farming and agriculture. Uh, East Harlem and the South Bronx suffer from many health disparities and community gardens in my district especially have played an important role in offering access to healthier food options and to offering much needed access to green space respites during this very difficult time. I'm hopeful that this study will help us uh, gain much needed information to support the growth and the sustainability of urban farming and agriculture in the city. And I am now happy to turn this hearing back to Chair Ku. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Ayala. We are also joined by Council Member Holden, Council Member Brennan, and Council Member Van Bremer. I will now turn it over to our moderator, Committee Council, Chris Satori, to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair Kuhl. I'm Chris Sartori, Senior Counsel to the Committee on Parks and Recreation, and I'll be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you'll be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I'll be calling on panelists to testify, so please listen for your name to be called as I'll periodically be announcing who the next panelists will be. 
We will first be hearing testimony from the administration, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I'll call on you in order. We'll be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer those questions. For members of the public, we'll be limiting speaking time to three minutes in order to accommodate all who wish to speak today. Once you are called on to testify, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any, when it is your time to speak. We will now call on representatives of the administration to testify. We will be hearing testimony from Mitchell Silver, Commissioner of the Department of Parks and Recreation, Sam Biederman, Assistant Commissioner of the Department of Parks and Recreation, and Bill Lasasso, Director of Green Thumb. And at this time, I will administer the affirmation to each representative of the administration. I will call on you each individually for a response. So please at this time, raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before these this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Silver? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Biederman? Yep. Thank you. Uh, Director Lasasso. Yeah. Thank you. And at this time, I will invite Commissioner Silver to present his testimony. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Ku and members of the Parks Committee. My name is Mitchell Silver. I'm the Commissioner of New York City Parks. It's good to see all of you once again and to offer greetings to the new faces on the committee as this new year begins. Joining me on today's panel are our Assistant Commissioner of Community Outreach and Partnership Development, Sam Biederman, and Bill Lasasso, our Director of Green Thumb. Additionally, uh, we have staff from our agency watching this panel, as well as the public testimony that will follow on the Council's hearing live stream. Green Thumb is an amazing division of New York City Parks. Initiated in 1978, as New York City was in the midst of a financial crisis, and significant social upheaval. When Green, when Green Thumb was created, it was able to assist neighborhoods in revitalizing local spaces and creating new and important community resources. Green Thumb continues that mission today by providing programming and material to support over 550 community gardens in this city, including workshops that cover gardening basics, as well as organizing topics. These are all volunteer initiatives. They demonstrate the strength of community bonds and what can be achieved when local government works in close partnership with New Yorkers. To help provide more detailed background about our Green Thumb Division and the various efforts we undertake alongside our community garden partner groups and to help maximize potential of these special gardens throughout the city, I would now introduce the director of our Green Thumb Division, Bill Lasasso. Good afternoon, Chair Ku and members of the Parks Committee. Thank you, Commissioner Silver, for your remarks. I am Bill Lasasso, and I serve as Director of Green Thumb at NYC Parks. Accompanying me today are Assistant Commissioner Sam Biederman and Director of Government Relations, Matt Drury. We're very pleased to be here today to discuss Green Thumb Community Gardens, the tireless work of New York City's volunteer community gardeners, the efforts that we have made at Green Thumb to support community gardening and urban agriculture in New York City. As there has not been a recent hearing on Green Thumb specifically, and since there are new members joining both the Council and the Parks Committee, please allow me to quickly explain Green Thumb, our model, and our support of community gardening and urban agriculture. As you know, Green Thumb is the community gardening program of NYC Parks with a mission of helping to create a more sustainable, resilient, healthy, and equitable New York City. Founded in 1978 to support the resident-led community gardening movement that had arisen during a time of disinvestment and abandonment of public and private property, we support a growing network of over 550 community gardens and tens of thousands of volunteer community gardeners through the provision of free access to public land, materials, technical assistance, operational support, public programming, and community engagement. We also serve thousands of New Yorkers who are interested in community-led environmental stewardship through public programming. 
as well as hundreds of thousands of annual visitors to Green Thumb Gardens who enjoy these cherished public open spaces. Green Thumb Community Gardens are unique public spaces that are stewarded by volunteer New Yorkers and which have helped catalyze sustainable, healthy, and equitable communities. Gardens thrive through a partnership between New York City government, community gardeners, and countless partners who, are collectively, who collectively care for these spaces in a shared spirit of service. Green Thumb Gardens reflect the history and the diversity of New York City's neighborhoods, and they serve as platforms for neighborhood beautification, social cohesion, teaching and learning, cultural expression, food production, health, environmental justice, resilience, and more. Reflecting the unique personalities and needs of our city's neighborhoods, Green Thumb Gardens range widely in size and nature and host a variety of activities from botanical horticulture and food gardening to passive recreation, special performances and programming, providing opportunities for New Yorkers to participate and collectively engage with their neighbors. It is important to note that it is not Green Thumb who determines how each garden will be used, but rather each individual garden group. Our core philosophy is that the local community volunteers that make up the garden groups best understand the needs and wants of their community. Within this context, we best add value by helping these groups realize their unique vision for each garden. That means that whether gardeners plant ornamental gardens, food gardens, or both, we support them in that undertaking. Thanks to increased support from city government in recent years, including the city council's discretionary allocations, a parks equity initiative, a greener NYC, and most recently the Playfair advocacy campaign, Green Thumb has experienced tremendous growth and an expanded ability to support gardens. Specifically, this has allowed us to provide new and higher quality materials, to increase the number of annual workshops, to develop new specialized trainings for gardeners, and to work with emerging garden groups to initiate approximately 20 new community gardens since 2016 with an additional 50 new gardens planned in the next three years through an innovative partnership with NYCHA. With the additional funding provided by Playfair in fiscal year 2020, we were able to make unprecedented levels of investment in gardens. This includes addressing long needed infrastructure improvements, including the installation of new fencing, signage and sidewalks, new workshops and trainings for gardeners, and expanded provision of materials including lumber for raised beds, compost tumblers, and expanded operational support through the addition of new Green Thumb staff. Green Thumb has supported urban agriculture since its founding, providing tools, equipment, training, and materials that support food production in Green Thumb Gardens. Food production has occurred in gardens since the beginning, and this has been a growing trend in recent years. Green Thumb has adjusted its programming and support accordingly to remain responsive to the needs of our network. We have developed new workshops and trainings on growing food. We've permitted garden groups to sell their own produce to support on-site efforts and form new partnerships to provide additional supplementary support for food producing gardens. Today, 83% of gardens on New York City Parks property grow food in some way. And we estimate that a significant amount of food is grown in gardens each year. Though the scale of production tends to be somewhat limited given the relatively limited size and capacity of these garden spaces. In addition, some gardens are able to distribute food to their community to support healthy food access through farm stands and local donations. Navigating the COVID-19 pandemic has of course proven challenging for all New Yorkers in so many ways, but we are proud to have been able to continue supporting gardens, including those growing and distributing food during this difficult time. We adapted our annual distribution of free plants to gardeners and hand delivered 110,000 plants to hundreds of garden groups throughout the city in May, including 45,000 food producing plants and thousands of seed packets. This represents the largest plant distribution in the history of Green Thumb. Working with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, we developed protocols to ensure that gardens could safely remain open to garden groups throughout the pandemic and that allowed garden managed farm stands to continue operating to support the safe distribution of healthy food during a time of need. In addition, while observing all applicable safety measures, we were able to work with garden groups and partners to renovate 15 gardens, 
build 375 new raised planting beds to increase to support increased food production and deliver over 2,000 cubic yards of topsoil and compost to garden groups across the city. Specific to the legislation being heard today, intro 1059, NYC Parks shares the council's interest in transparency and providing information about the wonderful work being carried out by our partners and volunteers. We appreciate the intent of the legislation and look forward to discussing this bill further with the council. In closing, we thank the city council for convening this hearing. We appreciate every opportunity to shine a spotlight on the tireless work of our dedicated volunteers at Stewart Community Gardens across New York City and showcase the work that we have been doing at Green Thumb to support them. We look forward to answering council members questions and afterwards, our agency staff will be viewing the public's testimony via the council's hearing live stream. Thank you. Thank you. And at this time, I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Ku. Panelists, please stay in, unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council. Uh, we are also joined by Council Member Bavella and Council Member Levine. Commissioner Silver and Assistant Commissioner Sam Biderman and Director of Green Storm, uh, Bill Los Losaso, thank you, thank you for coming to today's testimony. So I have a few questions. Uh, Commissioner, how many community gardens are there in the city broken down by agency? Now, how many green thumb gardens are there in the city and how many other agencies? Uh, thank you for that question, Chair Ku. Uh, as was stated, we have over 550 community gardens. Uh, that's part of our green thumb program. Uh, there are other gardens uh, through NYCHA. Um, and we have worked with NYCHA to help them to manage about 50 uh, of those gardens. Um, I know they had some informal spaces. It could number in the hundreds, but in terms of the ones I'm familiar with for parks, it's over 550. And for NYCHA, there are about 50 that will be working to help manage uh, those NYCHA residents for those gardens on NYCHA property. Can we have a breakdown of, like, of gardens by borough, like Queens, how many? Um, blondes, how many? We, we can supply you. Uh, Bill Asasso certainly has those numbers and we can supply those with you uh, after this hearing, but we certainly have the breakdown of how many gardens per borough. Thank you. So um, how many? Sure, you, yeah, you, sure. I would just add that, um, it, you know, for um, you and your staff, uh, council member, and for anyone following along, the Green Thumb website is a great resource for this information as well. Um, there's a great map where you can see all of the gardens laid out uh, across the city. Okay. okay. So how many gardens currently engage in urban agriculture? And where are they located? Well, let me answer first and I'll turn it over to, to Bill Lasasso. Uh, as was stated, about 83% uh, do some level of food production because of the scale of the garden. It may vary. Uh, so if it's 83% of 550, we can certainly do the math. Uh, but I'll turn it over to uh, Director Lasasso to see if he wants to uh, uh, provide more clarity to your question. Thank you, Commissioner. And thank you for the question, Chair Ku. Uh, of the 377 gardens that are located on Parks Department property, uh, 314 last we were able to count, uh, currently grow food in some way, which as, Mr., as Commissioner Stover mentions is 83%. Um, these food producing gardens are located throughout the city in all five boroughs. Um, and uh, I don't have it uh, available right now, but I would be able to provide a, a map showing food producing gardens um, throughout the city. Okay. So um, what is the average cost to maintain a community garden, Commissioner? Again, that varies. Each garden is different. Uh, these are not just gardens, but community spaces and they're volunteer led. 
Uh, so they do some of their own uh, fundraising or volunteer contributions, but the Green Thumb also supports them in various ways. So that's very difficult because some do food production, some do well, before COVID would do some community events uh, and the sizes are different about what they could accommodate. So that's very, very difficult. I'll see if Director DeSasso has some additional information, but it's very difficult to say on average how many of each of the gardens uh, spend money uh, to manage those volunteer spaces. Okay. Thank so you, Commissioner. Who, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it, go ahead. It, and it is very difficult to estimate. Um, some garden groups uh, uh, have small budgets, some have larger. Uh, what we've done in recent years, of course, as I mentioned, is, is realized uh, significant new resources, thanks in large part to the council's provision of supports. So we've been able to really exponentially increase the support that we're giving at Green Thumb. Uh, and there's another of, uh, number of other supports support mechanisms that they avail themselves of, including grants from nonprofits across the city. So, Tabata uh, Nasaso, you uh, just mentioned um, 50 new gardens in the next three years. So where will those gardens go? Uh, those are currently located on NYCHA property. Uh, several years ago, when the former um, chair of NYCHA uh, was concerned about the gardens on NYCHA property. I believe there were in excess of 700. We work with NYCHA to do an evaluation. Some just could have been a small plot and a flower bed. Others were advanced gardens. We've worked with NYCHA. They felt that Green Thumb would be better suited uh, to support those gardeners on NYCHA campuses. And so for the past couple of years, uh, Director Lasasso and his team evaluated those gardens that made the most sense, that kind of fit the standard of what we believe would be a community garden. And so we'll be working with NYCHA to bring those into our portfolio. Not Green Thumb per se, but we'll provide some of the technical support for those gardeners on NYCHA campuses. So those are the 50 that we're talking about. What Deletto Sasso did say as well is that we've added 20 new gardens since 2016. But these 50 are existing gardens, but they're on NYCHA property. I see. So who, who is responsible for maintaining the gardens? The, the farmers and the, the parks department? Primarily the volunteer effort would support from the Green Thumb team. We'll supply soils, uh, equipment. So it's a joint effort. Uh, all these gardens are volunteer gardens. They have the new signage. We'll explain uh, the hours that they should be open. Uh, but again, during COVID, we adjusted those rules. But it's a partnership between our volunteers and the parks department with resources in both the city and again, thank you city council from the city council as well and other grant funds. So the gardeners are responsible for, for, for what? Uh, for maintaining the gardens and your department is responsible for administration? That's fair to say, but it's also support. We offer a lot of technical support by way of training, by way of resources. Uh, some of these gardens are small or large, uh, again, they could be for food production, they could be for horticulture. <clears throat> Some have planting beds where a community person would just be responsible for their planting bed, but then the group collectively makes sure that is well maintained. But the volunteer groups, uh, each garden has a volunteer group. They're responsible primarily for maintaining uh, the, the community garden. So um, how many fundraisings, uh, gatherings, uh, uh, your department allowed them to maintain the community gardens. How many fundraisings I will they can do? Commissioner Biedemann or Director Lissasso, I, I don't, I'll let them respond to that question. Yeah. Uh, I'll defer to Bill on that. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Biedemann. Um, garden groups are now permitted to host fundraisers at uh, community gardens. It uh, was a change that we were happy to make recently in response to feedback we got from garden groups um, that hosting a limited amount of fundraisers on site would support them with operating and maintaining the gardens. Uh, and garden groups are now allowed to host two fundraisers every year to support their efforts and the operation of the garden. So if a community garden can no longer be sustained uh, by, the, by the gardening group maintaining it, what happens to the garden? I, yes, 
Thank you, Chair, for the question. Um, it is rare, but on occasion, garden groups will disband. But what we have found in Green Thumb in, in recent years is that there's a lot of interest in community gardening throughout New York City. So we have a community engagement team uh, of nine outreach coordinators who will work with uh, council members and community boards and members of the public um, to find interested parties to continue stewarding the space. Uh, and we've had really good success uh, on the limited amount of occasions where uh, a, a, safe, a space has become available. So we've been able to keep them active uh, within neighborhoods. Okay, so how often are the Green Dam licensing agreements with you? It's every four years. They're renewed every four years. And as Director Lasasso just stated, uh, we do listen and make some adjustments. And uh, so this year we didn't allow, allow for the fundraising, but every four years we have to renew all the agreements. So Commissioner, can you take us through the process of how the new rules are established in these license agreements? I'm gonna defer that question to Commissioner Biedemann. So um, this, uh, thank you for the question and thank you, Commissioner. Uh, this most recent round of uh, license renewals was preceded by a more robust engagement with uh, garden groups and garden advocates than uh, Grintham had really ever done before. And it did result in some significant changes to the license. Um, uh, but so we uh, reached out, I believe, with a draft license, I believe, um, uh, many months in advance of the uh, signing date uh, to get feedback from garden groups, to get feedback from advocates, then you know we take that back to the agency, discuss it with um, our general counsel and the city law department just to make sure everything is kosher, and then we finalize the license. So that, that would be the process. So what are the new rules? Uh, well, the license, the license is a... Um, a as licenses go, it's not the longest license in the world, but there are many details in it. Um, so there are some adjusts, some significant changes. Um, as Bill mentioned, one of them is uh, explicitly stating that gardens have the ability to have two fundraisers a year. That is that is a change. Uh, another significant change would be the lifting of a, an explicit liability um, requirement. So in previous licenses, uh, the gardens were made um, the garden groups were explicitly made liable for what happened in the garden. That language was lifted. This was um, thanks to feedback from the gardeners. That language was lifted from the license. Uh, so there is no strong liability requirement in the license now. Uh, yeah. So how much time are the gardeners given to look over any new rules in the license agreement before they have to sign on? Uh, Bill, I, I, um, I, I think that process actually started before I returned to the Parks Department. How many months was that? Uh, I don't know offhand. I, I, I want to say there was a couple of months provided. And then when there were some questions and some need for clarification, we were happy to extend the deadline and make ourselves available to speak with garden groups that needed additional time to review uh, the documents, either themselves or, or with their garden groups. Um, so we were committed to making sure that we made ourselves available to answer any questions or to provide any necessary clarifications. So what happened if the what happened to the gardens if certain groups do not sign the new license agreement? So um the groups that um uh, there were some groups that still had questions about the license agreements um yes. and that as uh director Losasso said um continued to have questions but they didn't sign at after, on the initial signing date. So uh, we worked with them and uh, made ourselves as available as we could to answer as many questions as we could on these licenses. And uh, the good news is that at this date, I almost every garden group has signed a license. It's about uh, no. really only a handful of groups left. I think about five left um, who haven't signed. Now, I think this goes to show this, this is a demonstration of what happens to the groups who don't sign the license. We make every effort to reach out to them. Um, you know, we want these relationships to work. We want these garden groups to uh, continue to volunteer on the gardens that they've built. So um, uh, we make every effort to get them signed. So 
So are there any current garden groups that have not signed the new lease? That you mentioned you have five about? Yes, there's about five who haven't Correct. signed the new, new license. Uh, are there any public meetings that gardeners can attend to express their ideas or concerns? So, As was stated, and, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Commissioner. As stated, um, so at the, the Green Thumb uh, keep in contact, we have outreach coordinators. So we meet by public meeting. Um, clearly a lot of stuff we do now, if we're gonna do it, it's gonna be by Zoom, but there's a regular contact throughout the years was stated in both my testimony and Director Lasasso. So uh, in terms of public meeting, uh, we used to have these larger annual events uh, because of COVID, we weren't able to do that. Uh, but certainly there are a lot of opportunities and then I'm almost certain the gardeners uh, meet among themselves. But I will now, I'm sorry, defer to Commissioner Biedemann and Lasasso. But I just want to make sure I understand what we mean by public meeting. Everything we do in the Parks Department is public, whether it's online or in person. Uh, but our effort is to reach out, give the support in any manner, and to listen to the community guards and see how we can help them out in any way. Commissioner, I want to go back to the five uh, uh, groups that have not signed the uh, agreement. Uh, why haven't they signed it? And does that mean they are closed? if they don't sign the new agreement? They're not closed. Uh, the Commissioner Vitamin is actively working with each of them. It's down to five or six. Uh, in some cases, we're having difficulty reaching them. Uh, it's a variety of reasons. It's not the same for each. But my staff has been very diligent. As we sit down and people express concerns, the gardeners, we go over uh, the language uh, to see exactly how we can address their concerns. So there is just really a, a few left. So at this point, we have 99% of all the gardeners that have signed and we'll continue working with them. Uh, so I'll see if Commissioner Biedemann wants to add to that, but there are, like I said, about five or six left. Yeah, yeah, yeah I haven't anything to add to that, Commissioner. Thank you. So what, what are their concerns? Why are they, why are they signing the le a new lease? Can you name a few concerns that they have? So, um, so um, some of the, um, some of the um, concerns are about that liability item that I um, uh, that I detailed earlier. There, I think we found in some gardens, uh, previous gardens that uh, declined to sign at first and then signed later. It seemed to be a question. It was mostly questions that required clarification uh, rather than adjustment um, for a lot of these gardens. So we continue to work to clarify those issues and liability you know, is a complicated thing. And uh, so we do our best to answer those liability questions uh, as, um, as we can, you know, as, as they come in. Um, you know, a couple of gardens, uh, it's different from garden to garden though. So liability is, tends to be the most common issue. Some gardens, you know, they're hard to reach uh, depending on the uh, organization of the garden. So it does vary from garden to garden with these five gardens left. So you mentioned that they are hard, some gardeners, they're hard to reach. Uh, how do you re reach them? By email, by telephone, or by mail? All of the above. All of the above? All of the above? Yeah. So if they haven't returned your mail or haven't uh, returned your answer, so how you contact them? Uh, the Green Thumb team continues to uh, attempt to reach out by phone, by mail, and by email. I, I have a thousand percent confidence in um, Green Thumb's dedicated outreach team. They are dogged when they uh, are <laughs> trying to reach out. So uh, they, they are on the case. So I will hope that at the last resort, you will go there and you know, go to the garden and find them there. Because I guess sometimes my senior citizens, they have a hard time to uh, listen to the phone or, or they, they don't read the email or things like that. No? Right, but they're, Commissioner uh, Chair Crew, they're not there every day. So oh. uh, not like a park where you have staff. Uh, some are there once a week, twice a week, three times a week. So it's not like, you'd have to probably sit there for a couple of weeks and I'm not sure we're committed to do really? that. But oh. I'm in staff to reach out uh, to find um, the gardeners and get in contact with them so they can sign this agreement. So Commissioner, are any of the meetings you mentioned before are made aware to the public? 
how you communicate the meaning. Yeah, I'll defer to uh, Director Lasasso for that question. Thanks for the question, uh, Chair Ku. We've worked directly with the garden groups since they are party to the agreement. Um, so we've worked directly with the garden groups rather than engaging uh, the public. We, uh, as Commissioner Biederman mentioned, we uh, keep in touch with them through our outreach coordinators, through events that we have, through, through various events that we do in the gardens. Um, and we did uh, a pretty robust survey this year, uh, this most recent licensing round as well, to get as much uh, feedback as we could as we prepared for the four-year relicensing. And that's where a lot of the good suggestions that we got came from when we were able to make some updates to the license that were beneficial for the garden group. Great. And I just want to add very early on in my administration, because I see Raymond Figueroa and I see Aziz, and there were others very early on where there was some concerns about Green Thumb, I think was my first year as commissioner, that we sat down to express uh, just concerns um, about Green Thumb. And so uh, I fully stated, and I don't know if they knew, I wrote an article, wow, way back when I was in my 30s about Green Thumb Gardens. That was right before uh, Bette Midler was going to war with Giuliani and I see Lynn Kelly here. So I've had a long history of Green Thumb. It was a pleasure to meet with the Green Thumb advocates. And so I've told my staff we're committed to see what we can do. So in terms of public meetings, as Director Sasso said, I've gone to a lot of these harvest events. There was an annual program at Lehman, uh, sorry, at um, Hostos College, which I miss going to. And so there's a lot of opportunities to broaden uh, our reach uh, to let both the gardeners, but also other advocates that believe in these important public spaces come together and, and speak out. And I enjoyed those annual events. I learned a lot. Some of the most powerful speakers I've met uh, have been there and then took my own Green Thumb tour to Haiti Carthen and others just to see our incredible public spaces we have here. Thank you. So how does the garden and handbook relate to the actual license agreement? And is there any conflict between the two that can sometimes lead to confusion among gardeners? I, I can speak to that. Uh, so the gardener handbook is uh, a document that really we prepare to be a one stop of as much applicable information uh, to help garden groups succeed as possible. Some of it, the information in the handbook includes gardening 101 tips. Some of it is direction to gardeners on what do I do if uh, a contractor shows up at the garden and wants to work on the building immediately adjacent to the space? Who do I contact? You know, what rights do I have to make sure that a permit is issued? Um, who do I contact if I want to get uh, a permit to use a hydrant to, to water the garden? And are there any other applicable regulations or rules that govern activity in the space? So we've outlined some rules, for example, from the Department of Buildings that outlines um, how big a shed could be or how big a structure could be in the garden before it needs a permit. And we really created it to be a resource for the garden groups uh, to bring as much information into one place as possible. To our knowledge, there is no conflict um, between the, the handbook and the license. We've, we've gone through it uh, pretty closely uh, to make sure that that is the case. And anytime that there's been a needed clarification, we've sat down with garden groups and gone over it line by line. And we've really found that to be helpful to, to explain the content, um, where it comes from and how it can be used by the garden groups. And Thank um, you. if I could add one thing, when there is an update to the handbook, this is some um, uh, something we committed to in conversation with um, Aziz and Raymond, that uh, when um, uh, the, when Grantham would make an update to the handbook, that all the gardeners would be notified both via email and via um, US mail, so that, um, that those updates were, everybody was on the same page, everybody knew about them, and there was transparency about them. Okay. So I have one more question and then I'll turn over to my other, my colleagues in the committee. So regarding the licenses, are there any future changes con uh, being contemplated to further support urban agricultural practices when it comes up for renewal again in a few years? Uh, well, it is three years away from now since this one had just uh, been resigned. Uh, 
as Director Lasasso said, urban agriculture is, is voluntary. Uh, we do not prevent them from doing it. If they do, we can certainly offer them the guidance. Uh, but that clearly is up to the volunteer efforts uh, because it does change what you do in your garden. So it is not prohibited, but it is not mandated. It's up to each garden. So we can certainly have a conversation about urban agriculture. As you know, it's seasonal and it's a, a, a very small supplement to the overall city food production, but it's something we can certainly have conversations with the community gardeners to express uh, the interest in increasing food production. Again, because its footprint is so small, it would be a very small supplement, but I'm sure it would be still important uh, to a local community. So we certainly can have that conversation, but it's something we would not want to mandate. We could encourage, but we could not mandate garden, gardeners shift from horticulture to food production. So are, are there any rules that uh, each garden, how much they charge individual farmers? Uh, in, in, individual farmers? Uh, I give you a plot, uh, how much uh, they have to pay the, the garden for administration? I, I think, uh, Chair Ku, I want to make sure we make a distinction between urban farm and urban agriculture. Uh, a lot of the food production that's happening on gardens are just given away. In some cases, they're being sold to help support the garden itself, but it's not, since these are very small lots, 25 by 100, some can be larger. So urban ag really isn't something where you're looking at a full-scale urban farm. Uh, community gardens are somewhat different. I'll, I'll defer to Director Lasasso to see if he wants to add to that. Uh, but I believe uh, people just come in, they agree to take care of a plot or do a certain function, and they're part of that community gardens network. Uh, but I don't believe there's a fee charge to someone uh, to actually be able to grow either horticulture or food in that garden. Direct with Sasso? Thank you, Commissioner. Um, we do not permit a mandatory fee. Some groups uh, are permitted to, to charge what is usually a nominal fee to support the basic operation of the garden, 10 or $15 to help support them buy seeds or, or buy shovels or you put on events for the community. But we do have a requirement that there also be an alternative to any kind of membership fee. So um, we want to make sure that gardens are accessible to everyone, that uh, financial means is not a barrier to being a member to a Green Thumb Garden. So if somebody is not able to, to pay a plot fee or a basic membership fee, they are able to do some additional work around the garden or perhaps host, host open hours or, or share a special skill that they have with the garden group. So we've done everything we can to work with garden groups to make sure that gardens uh, don't have any barriers to membership and, and gardens are supportive of that. that. Our Green Thumb community gardeners are very much community centric and community minded and they're always interested in bringing more people into the garden and not creating barriers. So, uh, Director, I have one more question for you. Um, so, suppose a senior citizen they want to do something on the garden, right? They hey, they have some free time. You know, they retire. Is there a waiting list for them to sign on the the, the community garden, or it depends in which area you live in? Uh, thank you, Chair Koo. There may be a waiting list to get access to a plot. Some gardens, many gardens are relatively small in scale as Commissioner Silver mentioned, and there's only so many plots that can be fit. Mm -hmm. But what we have found is that all garden groups find innovative and creative ways to broaden membership and to allow people to join the group. So even if they don't have access to an individual plot in the first year or two, they do have a way to be a part of stewarding the garden or perhaps participating in a communal plot and each, each group makes its own determination on how plots are allocated, but membership is very broadly defined and we find that groups are very welcoming. Although sometimes there may be a small way to get access to a growing plot. Okay, so if they're interested to join, they just, how do they join? I mean, they just look up the Green Thumb uh, directory, what? There's a lot of different ways. The best way is to, to go to a garden and introduce yourself and you will find some of the most welcoming and inviting people in the world stewarding Green Thumb Gardens and gardeners will be happy to give a tour of the space and tell you the history of it. A lot of the history of these gardens is amazing. Um, and if they're not able to, to reach the group or, or they want to just reach out directly to Green Thumb, we have a whole team that can facilitate introductions to, to provide pathways to membership. 
Thank you. I finished my questions. Uh, I want to turn it over to council, our moderator. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Koo. Uh, we'll now move on to questions from other council members. Uh, I will call on members to ask their questions in the order that they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you'd like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please raise it now. Uh, council members, again, please keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time's up. Uh, you should begin once I have called on you and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin uh, asking uh, your questions. Uh, first, we will hear from Council Member Barron, and she will be followed by Council Member Riley. Your time starts now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to the chair and to the panel for participating and sharing the information. I did not hear most of the uh, testimony, but I do have a specific question that I would like to pose. Uh, first of all, oh, I'm so sorry. Commissioner Silva, thank you for the work that you continue to do. We've had a great partnership in developing the major parks in my community and having them refurbished and restored. So I wanna thank you for that. And commendations to Marty Marr for the great work that he has continually done in our community and the staff that works with him. My question particularly goes to a garden that's in my community. Uh, it's a garden that has been operated for perhaps maybe as much as 15 years or more. And it's the Green Valley Garden on New Lots Avenue. We had to battle, first of all, to keep it as a garden. There were plans from the city to take it over and include it in some development that was being conducted. Uh, and we had to fight and battle and get a lawyer to prove that it was in fact a protected garden and we were successful with that battle. Subsequently, there was development that was planned across the street and the height of that building would have had a negative impact on the sunlight that would have uh, been able to reach the garden. So we negotiated. Uh, I'm very much concerned about housing, but gardens are important as well. And we had the developer lower the building substantially so as to not be as much of a hindrance to the sunlight. The uh, developer agreed that they would in fact, again, after negotiations, that they would in fact participate in installing a grow light so that there would be some compensation for the sunlight that was diminished during that growing season. But now it appears that we have a bit of a problem. I've been told that there needs to be a more substantial building constructed or structure erected to accommodate what would be the electrical outlets and poles and all of that thing. So I don't know if you or someone on your staff can speak to that topic and give us some input as to what is the process in proceeding so that we will be able to get that grow light installed and have that service provided, which the developer said that they would do. Well, first, thank you uh, for your comments, Councilmember Barron. I am not familiar with the details. I will see if uh, Director Lasasso does. Uh, so I'll see whether he has any information about that specific garden. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner and Councilmember. Uh, thank you very much for your support of gardens. Um, in my entire tenure at, at Green Thumb, you've been a strong supporter, and I know the garden groups are very appreciative of that. So thank you. Thank you. I, I am familiar with the space, and it's. Um, uh, a, a bit of a technical question, uh, as you allude to where we're at. The, the specific challenge here, and I will be happy to follow up offline with more details uh, if you're interested, is that installing electricity into a structure um, cannot occur uh, unless that structure is registered with the Department of Buildings. And the existing structure is not currently registered with DOB. We, we did have a chance to speak with the garden group and it's a great garden group who does a lot of great work in the neighborhood, yes. as, as you know, um, mm -hmm. and, and does a lot of, of food related work, very pertinent to the topic of this hearing, um, and tried to outline um, where the technical challenges were and what may be some possible paths forward. One of them would be um, getting 
uh, in a, another greenhouse that a prefabricated greenhouse that already met DOB specifications um, that could be more easily electrified. And, and I don't want to speak too deeply on it because I'm not an electrician, but I, I would be happy to get more information for you and, and follow up if you have further questions. Okay, because it's been a, a struggle, as I said from the beginning, but uh, I'm used to struggling when the cause is a righteous and just cause. And as you alluded, this particular garden has been around for years and the contributions that they make to the community are truly outstanding. Yes. And they have uh, the beehive and the bees come and we can get the honey and all of that, the uh, local honey, and that's so important as well. So I look forward to talking with you afterward as well as my staffer, Ms. Anita Fisher, who is my liaison in this, to find out specifically what needs to be done and what are the timetable that we can establish to accomplish that, because the building is up. I'm so now the sunlight is being impeded. So I just want to uh, be sure to get back to you so that we can progress. And thank you so much to the panel and to the chair once again for allowing me my question. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Barron. Next, we'll hear from Council Member Riley. He will be followed by Council Member Ayala, followed by Council Member Levine. Your time starts now. Thank you, and thank you, Chair Ku, and to the panel for this presentation today. I'm very supportive of community gardening, and my question is: uh, Has the Parks Department ever uh, seen a community group abandon their garden, and if so? Um, what is the process of another group possibly taking over the garden or is that garden completely just dismantled? Also, um, is there any way that a community group who has a community garden sell the produce that they're actually making in the garden to the community? Uh, well, first, welcome Councilmember Riley. I will defer that question to Director Lasassa. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, thank you, Commissioner, uh, Councilmember Riley. Um, on occasion, Green Thumb Gardens can become inactive. That's the term that we use at Green Thumb. Um, and that just means that the group that was stewarding it for, for whatever reason um, disbanded. Sometimes people can move from the block or people's interests can change and the space will become inactive. It's rare, uh, but it does happen. Um, and typically when that's happening, our, our team at Green Thumb has an idea that the group is beginning to dwindle and we start working proactively to find interest in the neighborhood to keep the space active. So we have a, a community engagement team whose sole job is to work with communities surrounding Green Thumb Gardens to engage uh, elected officials and community boards and members of the public and nonprofits and CBOs to introduce them to community gardening and with community gardeners. Um, so we've had a lot of success reactivating spaces. So um, I'm confident that if a space were to become inactive in relatively short order, we could reactivate it similar to how we've done in the past. And your second question about sales. Um, several years ago, uh, predating me, but I think a couple of licenses cycles ago, the Parks Department did begin allowing Green Thumb Gardeners on Parks property to sell the produce that they grow. And this was again in response to feedback we got from community gardeners and uh, as I understand it, what the Parks Department heard was that being able to sell the produce would give them a way to distribute it to the community, of course, but to help support the operation of the garden. If you can sell some tomatoes or cucumbers when the, when the crop comes in at the end of the year, you can then buy soil or, or more seeds or more plants for the next year. So we do permit that, provided that all of the revenue goes back into supporting the garden. Thank you. Uh, that answers my questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember. Thank you, Councilmember Riley. We'll now hear from Councilmember Ayala, followed by Councilmember Levine. Your time starts now. Thank you. Um, so my question is, has, has the Department of, of Parks and Recreation or Green Thumb done any type of analysis on what uh, neighborhoods are most in need of new urban agricultural sites? Well, let me, when you say urban agricultural sites, we know where the gardens are located and where, I guess, the gaps exist. 
Uh, so, uh, but we look at gardens in general, not urban ag in particular. I'll defer the rest of that question to uh, Director Lasasso, but we do have a map spatially to show where there are gaps in, I guess, a walking distance to Green Thumb Gardens. Uh, so I'll then defer to uh, Director Lasasso. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you for the question, Council Member, and of course, for your continued support of, of Green Thumb Gardens. Uh, I know you have a lot in your district as well. Um, so as Commissioner Silver alluded to, we do look at neighborhoods throughout the city that don't currently have a garden. We would look specifically for siting a green thumb garden and then let the group of course choose whether or not they wanna grow food or they want to grow flowers or a mixture of both. We have the long-term goal of establishing a green thumb garden within a 10 minute walk of every single New Yorker. It, it is ambitious and long-term, but we have all seen that a neighborhood is a better, stronger neighborhood when they have a green thumb garden. So gardens are clustered. We have about 550. They're, they're clustered in, in five areas um, throughout the city, largely. Um, so we've developed a set of criteria in, in a pretty robust map, which I would be happy to share after the hearing, showing those areas in the city that don't currently have a garden. And we're specifically focusing and prioritizing our efforts on trying to find those, those few remaining empty vacant lots in the city to potentially start a garden there because I think we all know once a vacant lot is gone, it's, it's probably gone for our lifetime. So we are focusing on those neighborhoods that aren't currently here. Okay, I appreciate that. I wanted to recognize Ray uh, Figueroa from Friends of Brook Park. He's in my district. Love, love, love what they're doing at that garden. Um, but I have two questions. I only have three minutes left. Um, what portion of the budget for green, um, of the green Thumb or otherwise is devoted to promoting and supporting urban agricultural programs and community gardens? And two, um, do, do we know of any, any gardens that were either unable to or opted to not open during COVID? Bill, why don't you respond? Of course. Um, I don't have an exact breakout uh, council member on urban agriculture related portion of the budget, but I, I'm confident saying that it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, which was of course um, an exponentially large amount of support last year due to Playfair. And that's primarily broken into providing uh, clean topsoil that's chemically tested to, to, to be safe for, for growing food, providing really high quality lumber for raised beds, uh, indirectly supporting urban agriculture through infrastructure, uh, supporting the gardens. And we've spent tens of thousands of dollars on providing free plant starts and seeds to garden groups throughout the city and developing new workshops and public programming and trainings to support those that are interested in food production. And that ranges from gardening 101 to really advanced gardening techniques. Okay, and regarding the question around the gardens that either opted to or were unable to open during COVID, is there a number? I don't have a number um, off the top of my head. I, I can get you an estimate. We don't know exactly, but what we did do is was defer to each group. We worked very closely with parks operations and the Department of Health to develop protocols to make sure that the gardens could remain accessible to garden groups. So they were always open to garden groups during COVID. They were closed to the public during the height of it in the interest of, of public safety, of course. And then we developed protocols as the situation evolved uh, with operations and with Department of Health to advise groups on maintaining social distancing and signage and what kind of PPE might be necessary to begin to invite the public back in. But we've always approached this through a lens of best practices in public health. I appreciate and that. I, would... I appreciate the support oh, um, also on the bill. Um, this summer we had the, uh, the garden at the Randall's Island um, and they were just phenomenal um, in terms of, and I know that Ray does this all of the time too in the South Bronx, um, you know, contributing to the local food pantries was really critical, um, especially, you know, in the 8th Councilmatic District. We were hit really hard and food disparities continue to be a real thing for us. So it would be really, it would be nice to, you know, at least do a study to have a better understanding of where food is being grown, how we're processing, who we're, you know, where, where this food is being distributed to. Um, because I think that, you know, we underestimate the importance of community gardens sometimes. Um, and, and we've learned, I think, specifically during this pandemic, how, how critical they are in terms of helping us meet the, you know, supplement the needs uh, in the community uh, that has been deprived of an opportunity to really have access to fresh uh, foods uh, during this pandemic um, for many reasons. So, you know, I thank you for that. And I, you know, I, I look forward to, to passing this bill and hopefully getting 
um, you know, some answers to some of our questions and figuring out how we can be more supportive um, as a body so that, you know, we're able to really look at this more holistically. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Ayala. Next up is Councilmember Levine. Uh, before Councilmember Levine starts, I'll just ask if there are any other council members who have questions, please use the Zoom hand raise function now and we'll go move on to Councilmember Levine. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you to Chair Ku for your great work in this hearing. And it's really a pleasure to see you, Commissioner Silver, re really grateful for your leadership for parks in this city. I just want to say how precious I consider the community gardens. Uh, I really feel they are an essential component of the park system, not an appendage. And I feel like their value now in the pandemic and, and post pandemic is actually greater than ever, in part because just having any space for people to be outside right now, it's really a lifesaver. I, I, th I can't imagine what this city would have been like without our park system and, and specifically community gardens. But I also think that as Councilmember Ayala was just uh, saying very forcefully, um, we see more than ever just how critical access to fresh fruit and vegetables is to health. Uh, it really uh, critical to closing health inequality that has been exposed by this pandemic. And so community gardens really have, I think an even more important role to play going forward. And, uh, and, and I, I know you agree with that. I just wanted to ask a couple follow-up questions. So the current license agreement is dated 2019, correct? And I think you, I might be confused on this. I think you mentioned a four year term for that. So does that mean that this agreement expires, I guess in 2023, and then it would be subsequently reviewed, renewed for another four years? That is correct. Okay, and is that the normal cycle? This is an every four years process? Correct. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, in, in terms of the liability obligations, uh, as as defined in the agreement, which which I know has been very contentious, um, just perhaps you can expand or, or or clarify if if part if if garden volunteers, community garden volunteers, are um, shoveling snow uh, after after a storm, uh, and and they leave a spot undone accidentally. Are, are, are they then as volunteers liable to be sued as a result of that, according to the, this agreement? Well, let me, uh, I'm not sure to answer that question. Let me defer that to Commissioner Biedemann uh, about the, li the new liability clause in the, con in the agreement. So thank you, Commissioner, and uh, thank you, Council Member, for the question. Um, the, so it, if in the unfortunate case there's an accident or a lawsuit um, regarding anything that happens at the garden, it would be left to a judge to decide um, what the who's liable for the accident that happened. Uh, just as a reminder, prior to this, the licenses stated prior to the current license, the licenses stated that um, it was the garden groups were liable for everything that happened in the garden. That language was lifted, and so now it is up for a court to decide in the um, unfortunate instance that something like this should happen. And how, how often does such an instance occur? Has not happened in my memory under uh, my leadership. I mean, yeah, it's exceedingly rare. Uh, uh, that, that, that's good to hear. Uh, we just want to make sure that these volunteers who, I mean, I just have to say a word about the volunteers. I mean, uh, the community garden volunteers in the city are absolutely incredible uh, what they've done uh, in many cases turning these spaces from abandoned vacant dangerous places to uh, just thriving community gathering spots and sources of healthy food and environmental education and none of them are getting a, a penny for that effort so you know I think at all times we want to uplift them and celebrate them and uh, certainly uh, we don't want them to feel that they're they're facing legal liability uh, if they're just trying to do the best they can. But um, I'm, I'm short on time. So I just, I did want to ask about the study a uh, commissioner that you referenced um, that I think is looking to understand uh, food production. Uh, do I have that correct at our community gardens or am I confused? Sorry, f forgive me, the, the study you're conducting now on community gardens. 
There's no, no, I think that uh, the intro 1059, uh, Council Member Ayala would like us to. For, forgive me, yes. yes. So, but, uh, so, so, and the administration's position on that is. Oh, we believe in transparency. We like to actually elevate the work that our community gardens are doing. So we'll work with council. Uh, we believe in transparency. Uh, we're very grateful. This is a one-time report that would give the council the information they need to better understand what is happening in our community gardens, specifically urban agriculture. So we're certainly willing to work uh, with the council. Uh, we believe in transparency and we believe it will provide valuable information. Okay, I mean, thank you to you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks to Chair Ayala for, for your work in supporting uh, these critical park spaces and the volunteers. And welcome thank back to the Parks Committee. It's good to see your face. Likewise. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilmember Levine. Uh, we will now turn it back to Council uh, Chair Ku, who has some additional questions. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Commissioner. I have uh, one more question. Uh, there is currently approximately nine hundred thousand dollars in city funding that has been fought for and allocated to purchase a parcel of the Frank White Memorial Garden located on 143rd Street and in Council Member Levine's district that is currently at risk and for sale by a private entity. These funds were secured to allow the garden to continue to operate, but we are hearing parks have not yet moved forward. Uh, what steps need to be taken so that the purchase can move forward. I'm not familiar with that specific garden, uh, Director LaSasse, so do you have information about that specific situation? Yes, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you for the question, uh, Chair Koo. So the Parks Department did receive Euler approval to acquire a, a vacant parcel immediately adjacent to a garden, um, and capital funds have been uh, provided uh, through discretionary allocations from Councilmember Levine and, and Borough President Brewer. But unfortunately, the city and the property owner have not been able to reach a negotiated upon purchase price. Uh, my understanding is that process continues, um, but at this point, uh, an agreed upon price has not been reached. So uh, can you, can your staff uh, get back to us? Uh, by Friday with the next steps uh, to, uh, to ensure that we don't lose the community garden? I, I will be happy to provide um, follow-up information, but just to provide one clarification, Chair, the existing community garden is not at risk. This would be uh, an expansion of the garden onto a parcel that is immediately adjacent to the existing yeah. space. So, but so I will be happy to get you follow-up information. Okay, yeah, please follow up with us, yeah. Because we don't want to lose the money or lose the site, yeah. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, are there any other council members who have questions? No, Cherko, no more questions from members. So, uh, you can go to public hearing. Thank you, Chair Koo. Okay. Mm. Uh, we'll now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. As I stated earlier, yeah. each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. So please begin once the sergeant has started the timer and given you the cue to begin. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom hand raise function. And I will call on you in, in order after uh, the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before uh, delivering your testimony. At this time, I'd like to invite Lynn Kelly from the New York Restoration Project to uh, speak, and she will be followed by Jessica Saab from New Yorkers for Parks. Your time starts now. 
Thank you, Councilmember Ku and the rest of the City Council. I appreciate the invitation to be able to speak today. My name is Lynn Kelly. I'm the Executive Director of New York Restoration Project. Um, for those of you that don't know us, uh, New York Restoration Project, we steward over 80 acres of parkland on behalf of the city, um, and we operate 52 community gardens, which is about 20,000 square feet of uh, actually food production right now throughout the five boroughs. Um, I think it's been well documented about the benefits of community gardens, um, health, mental, both mental and physical, and especially so within the onset of our pandemic. Um, it's proven itself time and time again, gardens, green space, our essential city infrastructure. What I want to point out, though, and there's also um, been additional documentation on this through the Food Bank of New York City, New York City residents make up half of all food insecure people in New York State, and the rate here is rising. We're 12 percent higher than the national rate. So between rising unemployment, the impacts of the pandemic, access to fresh, healthy food is at a premium and it's becoming harder and harder to obtain. And that's why um, at the beginning of the pandemic, NYRP took immediate action. And we transitioned made many of our gardens that were used for passive recreation into small mini uh, urban agricultural oases in the city um, for, and for the surrounding communities. We provided gardeners with starts for plants, like the not actually the seeds, but the actual starts, extra tools, PPE equipment, in order to encourage increased growth of produce in these neighborhoods for distribution for free. And I'm happy to report that um, our gardeners are the heart and soul of our network, those volunteer gardeners, grew over 90,000 pounds um, since the onset of COVID. And that's equivalent approximately to $180,000 worth of produce that's been provided for free throughout the city at no cost. Um, we really hope that the city and the city council can help support the work of NYRP and our partners. Um, programs that allow New York City residents to grow their own food are critical. They need to be expanded and we need to be able to seek creative partnerships with city agencies. We applaud your efforts on uh, behalf of New York City to advocate for this. I'm pleased to see so many of my uh, gardener colleagues on this call, as well as New Yorkers for Parks. I wish we could come up with another $8 million for the Playfair campaign again for community gardens. Um, but I'm here in solidarity uh, and hope that we really see this as an opportunity for food production on some small scale in New York City. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Jessica Saab from New Yorkers for Parks. She'll be followed by Aziz uh, Dekan from the New York City Community Garden Coalition. Your time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Jessica Saab, and I am the Advocacy and Communications Project Manager at New Yorkers for Parks. I want to thank the Committee on Parks and Recreation for hosting today's hearing. Community gardens play a critical and often overlooked role in our city's open space network. With over 550 community gardens citywide, these spaces, which are created and maintained by dedicated volunteers, drive grassroots neighborhood development, create space for our vibrant multicultural communities, and help address food insecurity on a local scale. Many gardens are the site of food production directly, but others also act as sites for community-supported agriculture distribution, as well as composting. They also provide a means for young New Yorkers to directly interact with land in ways that are often not available to residents in our dense city. During the pandemic, some community garden groups stepped up even more, establishing community fridges, connecting networks of mutual aid, and growing additional food for neighbors. In 2019, New Yorkers for Parks launched the Playfair Coalition and Campaign, which sought to increase the expense budget for New York City parks. One of the key pieces of our budget platform was an $8 million investment into our community garden network. We were thrilled when the City Council secured this funding, which marked the first ever system-wide investment for community gardens. This funding allowed New York City parks to hire 15 additional outreach coordinators for the Green Thumb Division, provide fencing and sidewalk improvements, and provide materials for Garden City wide. While this funding was not renewed in the FY21 budget, we hope that the City Council and Mayor's Office will continue to value and invest in our community garden network and the incredible network of dedicated volunteers who maintain them. 
We are also testifying today in support of intro 1059, which would require New York City Parks to undertake a report to aggregate community gardens citywide that are engaged in urban agriculture, having a detailed accounting of where there are additional opportunities for green spaces and urban food production in the city will provide useful data for decision makers and communities citywide. We also believe the data gathered in this report would help the city better allocate resources to gardens in need of additional material support. The City Council previously re released a report called Growing Food Equity in New York City, which proposed multiple policy initiatives that would help garden groups respond more effectively to issues in their communities. We recommend that the Council implement those policies as well to better protect community gardens and enhance their ability to thrive. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. I'm happy to answer any questions the Council might have. Thank you, Rebecca. No, thank you, Jessica, sorry, yeah. So is there anything else uh, the city can do to support community gardens and urban agriculture? Um, well, as I stated, um, yeah. I think we think that um, that report, Growing Food Equity in New York City, outlined some policy initiatives that make a lot of sense for helping communities community gardens continue to grow and um, distribute things well. I think, as all have mentioned, it is based on volunteers. So it's tricky to codify this work. And, um, but I do think one of the policy initiatives that was mentioned in that report was finding a way to provide payment to volunteers for their work. So I think there are different ways that um, gardeners can be helped in this. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I want to ask Lynn Kelly the same question again. Uh, uh, can the city do more to help community uh, gardens and agricultural groups? Uh, yes, I would concur with certainly what Jessica has said, but I would add this. A lot of the times the challenge between partner organizations and the city um, often have to do with the the red tape or the process that has to occur. And there's a reason why there is a process. I mean, the city has its, its process for a reason. I'm not discounting that, but I'll give you an example. In the case of NYCHA, uh, my organization, organization over time was able to create a license agreement with NYCHA as an agency so that as garden groups that are uh, parts of tenant organizations apply to us to be able to do small plot gardening in otherwise underutilized spaces, we have a very succinct, quick process for approval now that we didn't have a year ago. So if there are ways of creating streamlined approval processes so that we can get things up and running, it's, I always say it's a garden is a lot different. Setting up a garden is a lot different than some of the large scale city capital projects. And in my point of view, they don't need the same type of procurement or the same type of level of uh, scrutiny, perhaps. Um, there should be some process in place, don't get me wrong. But I think if the council could encourage agencies that have land, not just the parks department, but remember, DOT has land, DCAS has land, uh, DEP has land, NYCHA has land. There, you know, think about if there could be one sort of czar over this, so to speak. I hate that word, but I can't think of a better one at the moment to really kind of co consolidate uh, some of this work and the processes with the city agencies. I think that would go a long way. I mean, thank I, you. Remember, I'll say this: like, if ever there was a time to move quickly and think creatively about how to get fresh produce in New Yorkers' hands. Look at any corner in any neighborhood where there's a food pantry and there's your answer. So now is the time to, to mobilize. And uh, I, I will hope that the elected officials on this call and the administration can figure out a way to work with us as partner organizations to make that happen quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We'll now hear from Aziz Dekan from the New York City Community Garden Coalition, and he'll be followed by Raymond Figueroa. 
Your time starts now. Hi, everybody, and thank you for um, letting me speak today. Chair Ku, thank you very much for your pointed questions. Um, your, your committee has come with some really good questions to the commissioners and, and Bill Lasasso on this call. Um, some of the things that, that have been said, um, I have some issues with. Uh, I think the word transparency has been bounced around a lot here. And um, during the license negotiation, I think there was an extreme lack of, of transparency in how we were working with each other. The license issue could have been resolved months earlier had Parks Department um, held more fruitful discussions with us, but that's water under the bridge, so to speak. And now we need to talk about how do we increase the work of community gardens, how during this pandemic, we um, find ways to increase food security in this city. And as people have spoken about it, um, you know, community gardens are a, a definite outlet for that. Um, I think part of what, we're, what we need to do is in this study, which I wanna shout out to Rafael Espinal, who started this process years ago. Um, my question comes around to transparency again. And I'm concerned, uh, uh, following up with uh, Councilman's, uh, Councilman Levine's question, how is the DPR going to conduct this study? Um, how will it be shared? Who are they going to talk with uh, about this during the study? Um, how is it going to be presented back to your committee, Chair Ku? And um, how, 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 how receptive are they going to be to our questions and to the things that we see as community gardeners, as we know the importance of our own gardens? Um, so I'm, those are my real concerns about this study. You know, we're in, the Community Garden Coalition is, is in support of Intro 1059. I think it's important to recognize what uh, Jessica Saab said about there are previous studies out there that can be utilized. Uh, as a part of the New York uh, COVID-19 coalition, we've been talking quite a bit about food security and the community gardens roles in that food security issue um, and food insecurity. Um, as uh, Lynn said, uh, all you need to do is go to a food bank and see what that's about. So anything that the uh, Green Thumb and Commissioner Silver can do to increase, you know, the ability and, and Chair Ku, you talked about, you asked about, are there rules that limit community garden activity? And in a 17 page license, there are a lot of rules that do limit us in what we can do. So we would like to see some of those relaxed and, you know, a partnership with Green Thumb that, that goes back for many years restored and that a communication transparency would be a, a top of the list on this, uh, how this study is proposed. Thank you. Thank you for your input, yeah. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from uh, Raymond Figueroa of the uh, New York City Community Garden Coalition and Pratt Institute, and he'll be followed by uh, Shayla uh, Begum from Uprose. Your time starts now. Uh, thank you very much. I first want to acknowledge the leadership of Chair Ku uh, and Councilwoman Ayala, uh, very much so, and I want to recognize also Councilman Levine for his uh, long-standing leadership uh, uh, as it regards community gardens. Uh, thank you again for convening this hearing. I'm uh, very, very grateful. Um, I just wanted to respond, I believe, in terms of my remarks in, in a couple of ways. Uh, first, I think what needs to, you know, with, uh, uh, and I want to direct this directly to Chair Ku. One of the things that the city really needs to think about is incorporating what I would call uh, an anti-racism equity lens uh, uh, in terms of assessing how to move forward with um, uh, the consideration of community gardens and the siting. Why do I say that? Um, the community gardens historically um, have have arisen in communities that have been historically marginalized as a result of structurally racist policies implemented via the city. Redlining, urban renewal, planned shrinkage were all aimed at relegating communities of color and disenfranchising communities of color economically and socially. 
What happened in response is that community residents rose up, not accepting poverty, not accepting racism, but accepting their sense of human dignity and reclaiming the spaces that have been abandoned, their communities that have been abandoned, uh, you know, as community gardens. And so that dynamic is still at play when we're uh, considering community gardens. Why? Because as we can see from the pandemic, the way it's played out, um, it's played out in such a way where there is disproportionate morbidity and mortality in communities of color, where these community gardens, in same places where these community gardens are located. Uh, what I like to say is that, for example, in the Bronx, community gardens organize themselves. I want to say a dozen, uh, approximately a dozen of us community gardens organize ourselves to aggregate our harvest. We grew uh, anywhere from five to 10,000 pounds. I don't have the exact number. I know that's a big window um, depending on how we measure, but it was, uh, it was over 5,000 pounds of food that we moved and uh, uh, market valuation in excess of uh, $36,000. The point being um, is that community gardens have risen um, to the occasion to respond uh, to this uh, situation of the pandemic. The city needs to really think that if it is not healthy um, from a community health perspective, from a citywide perspective, the economy is not going to be uh, healthy at, at, as well. People are not going to be I'm able expired. to be that are healthy. Um, I just want to just finally say that um, at Pratt, out of Pratt Institute, we've conducted a number of studies. Not only are community gardens growing food in a very robust type of way, uh, we are also uh, benefiting the city uh, fiscally in terms of our ecological system services, meaning that um, in the year that we, last year when we measured uh, ecological system services, just out of a sampling of 20 gardens, uh, the city is realizing $1.3 million in savings uh, to its sewage infrastructure, to its energy infrastructure, uh, and, and so forth as a result of ecosystem services. So the combination of benefits to local communities in, in terms of lowering pollution and benefiting the city fiscally, as well as producing health promoting food, and there's nothing more health promoting than locally uh, uh, grown nutrient dense food. So I just wanted to uh, offer that for your consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your suggestion and your input. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from uh, Shahila Begum of Uprose, followed by Alexis Mena of Uni University NYC. Your time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Shahila Begum, and I'm the Resilience Coordinator at Uprose. I'm here today on behalf of Uprose to express our support for Intro 1059. Founded in 1966, Uprose is Brooklyn's oldest Latino community-based organization. Uprose is an intergenerational, multiracial, and nationally recognized BIWOC grassroots organization that works at the intersection of racial justice and climate change. Thank you for addressing the need for community gardens and urban agriculture as a way to address resiliency efforts throughout the city. New Yorkers are extremely resilient and engaging with resources to provide supplemental food benefits for their community. However, this type of engagement should not fall on the community alone. The City Council Parks and Recreation Committee must commit to do more in support of community gardens in low-income communities and communities of color. Providing funding support and valuable resources to frontline communities secure the future of urban agriculture. COVID-19 has made a huge impact on communities of color, especially in urban areas such as New York City, for forcing to reallocate resources and cut programs such as compost collection. Due to these types of cuts on environmental sustainability, many New Yorkers turned to their local community gardens for their composting needs. Community gardens took much of the burden off the Department of Sanitation by reducing excess food waste and scraps in our landfills. Composting sites and local gardens throughout the city also play a vital role in building healthy organic soil to use for gardening and distribution. Low income communities look to these gardens as a source of supplemental food where there's a growing food crisis during the pandemic. The variability of food grown depending on local neighborhoods represents the many diverse ethnicities and cultures that represent New York City. For all of these reasons, community gardens function not only as ecologically resilient hubs for the city, but also uphold co social cohesion and, re and resiliency of our people. 
There are a maraud of benefits that's, and stacked functions of urban agriculture, one of which is climate resiliency. New York City receives an average of 45 inches of annual rainfall, which makes it difficult for our existing infrastructure to process, leading to combined sewage overflows and CSO. We see ongoing flooding every time it rains, continue, continuing to be a major problem in front of in frontline communities that also have to deal with pollution and flood damage. Urban agriculture is one way to relieve an excess amount of rainfall from overflowing our infrastructure since much of the rain is absorbed into the soil and spread through, slowly throughout. Furthermore, community gardens are also well known for rainwater harvesting in large tanks, which also plays a vital role in alleviating CSOs. Urban agriculture designs offer solutions for a healthier New York, reducing flooding, pooling in frontline neighborhoods, along with simultaneously producing the need for healthy food. Air quality and temperature is dramatically improved with the increase of community gardens where cities suffer from overheating due to urban island effect. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Alexis Mena of University of New York's NYC, followed by Maureen O'Brien from the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. Your time starts now. Sorry, I was on mute. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Alexis Mena. I'm a lifelong resident of Brooklyn, New York, uh, specifically East New York. Um, I'm an organizer. I'm a farmer. And a community chef. Um, I have been part of Finn and supported NYC with five community gardens, two school gardens, and two skate parks across New York City. And I think that we need to see more support, uh, direct financial support to people who are taking on urban uh, farming projects and landscaping and beautifying the, the parks. Um, two fundraisers a year. Uh, if you think about it, most of these community gardens are working on small uh, series of, of, of funders and followers uh, hyper-locally. So the most that they are fundraising in these, between these two uh, proposed fundraising events is somewhere between $1,000 to $5,000 on average from what I've heard back from a lot of the other um, gardeners. This is insufficient. We need more direct support. Sir, we're losing your uh, uh, your signal a bit. Is there a way we can? Is there a way you can move to a location uh, where we can get more clarity? If not, we can return to you at a later point. Have, which is the public land of the city. Thank you for my time. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from uh, Maureen O'Brien from the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, uh, who will be followed by Joseph uh, Raver or Reaver from the Elizabeth Street Garden. Your time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Ku, uh, council members, everyone here attending from Green Thumb and other organizations. I also want to shout out uh, Brenda Duchesne, Barbara Adamson, and Alexis Mena, out there, people who are community gardeners out there doing the work. So glad to see you. Uh, my name is Maureen O'Brien. I'm the community field manager at Brooklyn Botanic Garden, and I work with community gardens and urban farm volunteers in Brooklyn. Um, uh, BBG supports community gardens and public open green spaces, and we do support a study on the prevalence of urban garden food production and agriculture in New York City. Um, uh, we suggest that this study focus uh, very specifically on the volunteer gardeners. Uh, what community gardens and farms have and are doing, and what specific support would be helpful Ask and listen to the gardens and farm leaders first. And learn and gather advice about what they're doing and what they need and if they would like to do more. Our gardeners who are volunteers are literally the people on the ground. They're working with the soil and growing and they know what they need to continue doing that. Not every garden is interested in food growing and there are some limitations with soil and um, other you know, contaminations that 
not every single uh, situation is appropriate for food growing. Uh, ornamental horticulture and herbs and pollinator gardeners are also super important uh, to support the food growing uh, efforts. Uh, we advise that the study also prioritize communities affected by food apartheid. Gardens and farms led by black and brown people, neighborhoods that are low income and have no or low food access. Uh, healthy food and seeing food being grown is really important uh, so that people can develop healthy eating habits even if the food coming from the garden is not actually eaten. It's important that people know where food comes from. And we really uh, just um, praise the council for uh, taking a deep dive into more food access for people in New York. Uh, thank you so much. I wanna leave with the one thing that Leah Penniman stated yesterday at a conference at BBC, at BBG, sorry. We're in a triple, we're now in a triple pandemic. The COVID crisis, climate change and racism. All of these three things can be affected in a positive way through community garden support. Thank you. Thank you. Next, next up is Joseph Reaver from Elizabeth Street Garden, who will be followed by Sarah Williams of Green Gorillas. Your time starts now. Hi there. Um, I just want to thank the city council for for hosting this meeting. Um, you know, I think a good question that's come up uh, from council member Ku is that if there's anything the city can do to continue helping community gardens and green infrastructure uh, to let you know, um, you know, along with everything that's that's been discussed here, I think an important starting point is protecting and preserving community green space that's at risk and uh, already exists. Uh, as many of you may know, Elizabeth Street Garden is at risk of being developed and has been pitted against the need for aff affordable housing. Um, the garden itself is over 20,000 square feet of green space, actual green space in Little Italy, which is very underserved. Um, it's recreational areas, but it's also community garden beds. Uh, it's an outdoor museum as well. But within these community garden beds, we have volunteers and neighbors growing food, uh, growing vegetables, fruits, along with plants. Uh, and we have actually over 100,000 visitors each year, we have hundreds of free public programs based in educational workshops with local public schools, uh, based in gardening, uh, wellness, and arts and culture. Uh, all of this is being done by volunteer-based organization at zero cost to the city. I know a big discussion has been, you know, the funding with these community gardens, uh, and the funding with Green Thumb. Everything we're doing at Elizabeth Street Garden is uh, at no cost to the city whatsoever. Uh, and because of the size that we are, we're able to accommodate all of these different functions. Uh, in 2019, the city council voted in favor of destroying Elizabeth Street Garden. Uh, many council members are on this board um, and it doesn't have to be this. It doesn't have to be this affordable housing or green space. It can be both and we can achieve both. And we've actually identified an alternative site that can provide more housing. Um, so I think, you know, this pandemic has really highlighted the need for open green space. Um, and it's highlighted the need for community gardens. And it's actually uh, given us an opportunity to achieve uh, more affordable housing with existing vacancies uh, and more creative thinking that way. And so we really need to prioritize the green spaces and preserve that which exists. And so, you know, I, I urge the city council to start, to start uh, uh, looking at new approaches uh, and, and shifting their perspectives uh, and, and saving spaces like Elizabeth Street Garden because community gardens in general should be at the forefront of our plans for urban agriculture and our plans for pandemic recovery strategy. Uh, these things are intertwined and they're interwoven and they both are vitalities to the city uh, and community health. So, you know, I just want, I want to highlight Elizabeth Street Garden because it's a perfect example uh, and we really can set a, a new precedent in the way where uh, we're unfortunately being met with this housing versus green space or green space is at risk. East River Park as well. You know, these discussions, the community should be much more involved, I feel, uh, personally. Uh, and then speaking on behalf of the garden, uh, the city council, I urge you to, to really sit down and listen with the community because we're putting forth uh, creative plans uh, and we really wanna work with, uh, with you to achieve the uh, sure. preservation of these green spaces like Elizabeth Street Garden. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next up is Sarah Williams from Green Gorillas, who will be followed by Kara Goad from Earth Justice. Your time starts now. Thank you. I'm Sarah McCollum Williams, Executive Director of Green Gorillas, a nonprofit that supports community gardens and activates youth engaged in food justice across the city. Communities that were already experiencing food insecurity before COVID-19 are now depending on community gardens to survive. This year, many gardeners ramped up their food production for distribution to families, neighborhoods, and local organizations in need, sometimes uniting with other gardens to distribute across large networks. As Ray mentioned, uh, has happened in the Bronx, has also happened uh, elsewhere across the city. Even before this time of extreme need, however, community gardeners have been vital members of a larger movement towards food sovereignty and have been working vigorously for the right to healthy, fresh, culturally relevant food, the right to green space and community land ownership, and the right to health. For these reasons and many more, we support this initiative proposing a detailed study into food production in community gardens, ways to increase their food production and channels for making neighborhood grown food available to the community. And we thank council member Ayala for bringing this legislation. However, we express concerns about the ability of the parks department to adequately undertake this study. On key issues, including composting in the city, parks leadership has not upheld the interests of those who are working for food justice. We urge the city to think and work in expansive ways to support and recognize the value of community gardens across the city. Simultaneous to this, we ask that the unpaid volunteer labor being done by community gardeners be recognized within the proposed Parks Department study and recommendations. Community gardeners do essential life nurturing work to heal the soil, to foster connection with nature, to act for food justice, to preserve and protect the health of their families and neighbors. The most prolific and powerful community gardeners are often people of color, often from low-income communities, often women, often immigrants. Their work has tremendous community value, but it lacks vital economic support. We ask the city to increase their support for community gardens as essential infrastructure for neighborhood food production and to offer creative, adequate, and community-affirming funding to ensure that they can provide increased health and environmental benefits um, to communities across the city. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Kara Goad from Earth Justice. Hello, thank you. Yes, my name is Kara Goad. I'm a legal fellow at the Sustainable Food and Farming Program at Earth Justice. And I'm speaking in support of Council Member Yala's bill. We support this bill because it will bring more attention to the many benefits that community gardens provide to New Yorkers, which I'd like to highlight today. Community gardens offer numerous benefits to gardeners, neighbors, and garden visitors, including the opportunity to participate in urban agriculture. Through urban agriculture at community gardens, community members gain access to fresh and nutritious foods, including traditional foods that they might be otherwise unable to find. For example, at the Rockaway Youth Task Force Urban Farm in Queens, Gardeners grow callaloo, a popular Caribbean ingredient uh, that's not commonly available at supermarkets. In addition, community gardens offer neighbors the opportunity to learn about agricultural techniques. And one of these techniques is composting, a traditional method of enriching the soil and recycling the food and plant waste. In 2018, the BK Rot program at No Waste Lands Community Garden in Bushwick took in 70 tons of food waste for composting. And if this success were replicated at more community gardens, it would contribute significantly to the city's waste reduction goals. The city's community gardens also offer space for innovation in urban agriculture. For example, the Impact Farm at Harlem Grown uh, has solar powered greenhouse and a vertical farming hydroponic system. And it's one of the first of its kind in the United States. Urban agriculture at community gardens is especially important for people living in neighborhoods without easy access to fresh foods. And it's been a key resource during the COVID-19 pandemic, which has heightened food insecurity. Uh, in response to the pandemic, community gardeners across the city increased production and distributed fresh and healthful foods to neighbors and food banks in need. Uh, yet the pandemic also made clear that much more is needed, which is another reason we support this bill, it will help establish the foundation for expanding community garden food production. 
by requiring the Parks Department to collect information on urban agriculture at community gardens and make recommendations for expanding the number of gardens, uh, the bill further the benefits that community gardens offer. The information collected will highlight the important role that community gardens play in increasing access to fresh foods and vegetables, and it will support calls for the city to provide more resources and support to community gardeners. Um, so for all these reasons, we support the bill. We also urge the city council to take additional steps to protect the city's community gardens, which have few legal protections. Um, in November of 2020, or Justice, the New York City Community Garden Coalition and 52 other organizations partnered to submit a petition to New York City agencies requesting that they designate all New York City community gardens as critical environmental areas pursuant to the State Environmental Quality Review Act. Uh, this petition is available on Earth Justice's website and I urge you to visit it as it contains a tremendous amount of information about community gardens. A critical environmental area designation would increase protections for community gardens by requiring that agencies fully evaluate the impact of certain actions like nearby construction on the gardens, yet at the same time, it would not unduly tie the city's hands from moving forward with necessary projects. Um, our petition also asked the city to do a study of the gardens not specifically described in the petition to confirm that critical environmental area designation is appropriate for them. To assist with that study, we created a form on our website that community gardeners can share information about their gardens, including whether the garden is used for food production. Uh, we've received information about 20 gardens and over 300 people have signed on to our petition, which shows the widespread uh, interest in this issue and support for this bill. So in sum, because community gardens enhance public health, provide natural settings, celebrate the cultures of their gardeners and their neighborhoods, and contribute to the city's sustainability efforts, we urge the committee to pass this bill and to also consider additional bill to grant critical environmental status to all of New York City's community gardens. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have two uh, individuals registered under the name Brenda Thompson Duchesne. Uh, I'm going to call up uh, the first person, if you could state your name for the record and also let us know who, if you are aware of who the other person might be. Your time starts now. Good afternoon. I'm Brenda Thompson Duchesne. The other person is Barbara. She's also in my um, <clears throat> the garden. She's one of my gardeners. Okay. One of the things I heard today from um, Green Thumb saying they are helpful. I feel they are not helpful in a sense that I want to thank um, Councilwoman Inez Barron because the garden that she spoke about is my garden. The garden have a green uh, greenhouse, 25 by 40 feet. They have been there seven years. It incur increment weather. Um, when, it, when we was told that we cannot install the electricity, um, we had Brooklyn Range came in to do assessment and they said, okay, this is what we can do. All I'm hearing from Green Thumb is take down, take down. When they take down this greenhouse, which is growing food in it, are they going to replace it with the same size? One of the things is, as I hear everyone say in, in Brownsville, the, is in Brownsville, we started 11 years ago growing fresh vegetables because no one will come into the neighborhood. We did a study on food that was in the neighborhood, which was lousy. It was poor quality. For two years, we did the study with the supermarkets. These gardens is essential with the growth that we need to be able to give out. With this pandemic, we gave out over 1,500 free bags of food. The greenhouse, what we're trying to do is grow all year round. With that building, it took away all our sunlight. We even can't start, like now we start the seedlings, we can't do that. Is Green Thumb really want to help us? They have agencies that could come in and help us see what we can do 
to get this lighting. Instead of tearing down and spending what you don't have, let's work with what we have and see what we can do. If it's really that you're in engineer that is that terrible and they can't do anything, well, Brooklyn Range gave us an assessment. Something could be done. It don't have to be taken down. What are we going to do to help the community? We need transparency as Aziz and everyone else say, I don't feel is enough transparency. I don't feel is enough support. Yes, they give support, but not enough. And if they really want to help a community that is lacking in, in fresh vegetables, no one didn't want to come into Brownsville. That's the, why we started is about your lady of elegance foundation is a nonprofit that we could take care of the community and give with other people did not want to come in to help. We are helping ourselves and we need the support. Thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I would love to answer. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you very much. And I will now ask the um, your fellow Gardner to, to come up and testify. And again, can you please uh, just state your name for the record since we don't have it on your um, listed as your Zoom profile? Your time my, start. Name is, my name is Barbara Adamson, and I'm currently a member of Isabella Ladies of Elegance. And as Brenda Duchesne said, we've been growing produce to uh, sustain Brownsville and uh, other areas because no one wanted to come into this area. Um, as she said, we gave out over 1,500 bags of food and if we keep this greenhouse we can definitely start like we always do in late february early march so that our seedlings are ready to go in the ground at the end of the first frost which allows us to have extra growing time and uh giving vegetables to the community that needs them uh, we have horrible soil, and Green Thumb just came in and just, they are taking up what's there, and over the last 11 years, uh, different people, I can speak for myself, I've been purchasing soil to go in my bed to compensate for what I feel is the inadequate soil that we've been getting. Um, there's just no cooperation. Why can't um, members of Green Thumb do the DOB for us? We don't have that kind of money. They have staff that can do the research, find out what we need so that we can keep this same size greenhouse and continue the production of what we've been doing for the last years. But with all of this going back and forth, back and forth, I mean, it's preventing us from doing the most we can do. Uh, Green Thumb took down a small fence around our garden, what, what three feet? And uh, now the garbage is spilling from the building next door onto the sidewalk. And they're gonna blame us for the area being dirty. What are they doing with that three feet? It's just, it's, it's like a dictatorship now. I mean, gardening used to be fun. Uh, most of us are senior citizens. I'm 72 years old. And we go to the garden. We do what we have to do on the days that we need to do it. But we're older. And they're just not trying to help. It's like they're pushing the senior citizens out for modern technology of uh, the the licenses agreement, uh, it had more pages in it than a mortgage. I mean, we're not college students. Uh, we are baby boomers, and we don't understand a lot of the information I'm that's been given to us. But uh, they just want to implement their rules and regulations. And if you don't agree with them, then uh, you're pushed out. My three minutes is up, so I'll just be quiet. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, that was our last uh, registered panelist. Uh, if we have inadvertently missed anyone who is registered to testify and has not yet been called, please use the Zoom hand, raise hand function and you'll be called on to speak. Seeing none, I will now turn it back to Council Member Ku to offer any closing remarks and adjourn the hearing. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Before we close, I want to thank past department, Commissioner Silver, Assistant Commissioner uh, Biderman, and Director of Green Dome, uh, uh, Bill Lozasso, and also our committee staff, uh, Chris, Patrick, Chima, Monica, and of course my staff, uh, Elaine, and also want to thank all the public participants, Lynn Kelly, Jessica, um, and all the other ones. So thank you for coming uh, this really meaningful and fruitful testimony. Um, so the meeting will come to, will be uh, adjourned.